Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Decomposed, the music podcast where we talk to industry professionals and break down some issues that we see in the community. I am Michaela Walski. I'm a senior at DePaul University, vocal performance major. Hello, I'm Donna. I'm also a senior at DePaul University. I am a Bachelor of Music Uh, musical arts, uh, piano, and history double major. And here with us we have Dr. Harbert. Um, Dr. Harbert, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you teach, what you studied. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Alyssa Harbert. I'm an assistant professor of music at DePauw, where I teach courses in music history, music appreciation, senior seminar, and a wide variety of topics related to musicology. Um, I am currently teaching courses in women in Western music, history of Western music, and Broadway musicals this semester. Excellent. And today we were uh, wanting to talk to you and bring you in, and we were going to talk about um, so, some of the issues that we do see um, in, in Western music since you are our, our survey, one of our survey professors, um, and just kind of talking about how how that kind of looks now, what it might look like in the future. And um, you're an expert in both like women and we've also talked about exoticism and orientalism as well. So anything that you want to kind of bring in, uh, feel, feel free. Well, I've gained all of this expertise through teaching, through being here at DePauw and through teaching the kinds of courses that students want to take and need to take. None of this diverse musical representation was part of my training in fact (laughs) yeah if we can continue with like kind of your introduction like were there any role models that inspired you to pursue what you did um, all along the road I know like you have also done performance as well and Absolutely. I went to Lawrence University in Wisconsin for undergrad, and I was an oboe performance major there. But even when I started college, I was already quite interested in history of music. And to me at that point, I thought that that meant history of classical music. That was what I was interested in. That was what I thought was important when I was 18 years old. And that is what everyone else around me had told me was important um, coming up in rather, um, you know, un- unacademic music circles. I never have had any academic family members or musical music profession family members either. So I just assumed as an oboist that I would study classical music. And that's what I did in college. I studied classical music. And my History of Western Music courses in college at Lawrence were amazing. They were absolutely wonderful. They were also... I would say 99.9% about dead white men composers, mostly from Western Europe. And then when we get to the 20th century, we add in some United States men composers, white men composers. Uh, And so throughout my time in college, I had almost no exposure to um, a broader diversity of composers. And I want to mention, I went to college in the 21st century. I graduated from high school in 2001 and began um, my time in college a couple of days after September 11th, 2001. So that's a story in itself, <laughs> in itself uh, a sad one. But when I was in school, um, I didn't even notice the lack of representation in my curriculum. I did have an oboe professor, Howard Niblock, who I I love and adore very much, and I wouldn't be who I am without him. And he often gave me music by women composers for oboe solo, like Libby Larson. Um, And I started to get interested in feminism and in women in music only when I went to a panel of, of Lawrence faculty and my oboe teacher Um, who is a straight, cisgender, white man, was there speaking on this panel about feminism. I had no idea before then that men could be feminists or that men would even care about feminism. And that kind of opened up my eyes in a big way. (laughs) And then I had a spectacular music history professor, Julie McQuinn, who is still um, active teaching at Lawrence. And I love and admire her more than almost anyone in the world. 
Uh, I would never have gotten into this field or been able to be as successful as I have been without her mentorship. And, you know, her primary area of, of study is, is Claude Debussy. So again, with the, with the white male um, European dead composers, but she brought in a lot more discussion of social history than I had ever experienced before. And if you're going to teach about women or people of color in history of Western music, you need to take a social history approach rather than a life and works of the great composers approach. So that opened my eyes even further. Um, if you'd like to hear about my master's and PhD, I can tell you about that briefly. So I did my master's in oboe performance at Wichita State University. Um, and I won't say too much about that experience other than I played basically only classical music. I played in the Wichita Symphony Orchestra and I played oboe and we only played, of course, symphonic works. And I only studied Western European classical music. I had courses, so in my coursework, per, per, particularly courses on um, 19th century romantic European music. Um, I had a course on film music, but even that was also entirely about white male film composers and sort of a life and works approach. So I had no diversity in my training in my master's. And then my PhD in history of Western music, um, or musicology as we call it, was uh, from 2007 to 2013, were the years I was in my PhD at Northwestern University. And gosh, we only studied Western classical music there as well. Um, we had quite a bit more discussion of women in music at that university because that women and gender was one of the primary areas of one of my faculty members. But in all of the other classes I took, that was almost never um, on the table. So a little bit more women in white, mostly white women and entirely in art music. I didn't have any courses that were not focused on art music. So I had courses on Wagner, courses on American art song, courses on the Neapolitan style in the 18th century. Um, and frankly, never really questioned it that much. It never made me angry that we didn't study any black music in, you know, particularly or music from other parts of the world. It didn't, for some reason, I just had it still in my mind that musicology was about classical music. And I tell you this now because I no longer feel this way at all. And I'm sure that that's what we'll talk about mm -hmm. going forward. So that's a bit about my background. Awesome. Thank you so much. So there's such a limited amount of time in any collegiate course. And, and like you've, you've mentioned, you've been in so many where all, all the time was dedicated to uh, talking about these dead white European men. Um, but how do you balance including lesser known composers um, and, and introducing new voices into the mix, but having to take away from somewhere else? So the key here is to reframe your thinking of what a history of Western music class is. Uh, so in the past, it would historically, it would be a class about musical works by specific composers. And it was very much focused on the compositional process and the evolution of style with an emphasis on innovation of style. Um, and that is still primarily how we teach our History of Western Music survey at DePauw because that is the tack that our textbook materials take. And this is, this is a, big, uh, a big challenge for me. If you want to teach more diversity, whether that's gender, sexual, class, um, and particularly race, ethnic, and you know, region of the world diversity, you need to reconceptualize not studying the evolution of style of classical music, but instead studying the means of production of music, and not just classical music, but also other kinds of musical activities from vernacular, you know, what we might call folk music, to commercial, what we would call popular mm -hmm. music, and you need to consider all of the varied social and political factors that come into who makes music, for whom, why, how are they compensated, who supports musical works. Um, and so when you change to a social history perspective, it's not about 
composer biography as much anymore. And when you change to thinking about music in terms of the huge, vast variety of styles and genres, it's not just about literate, meaning written down, notated music anymore. And then you have a much wider and more diverse range of subjects to talk about in class. So you can talk about performers like Jenny Lind, um, who Michaela mm -hmm. loves, and you can talk about music patrons. You can talk about um, folk and a uh, variety of anonymous composers and um, particularly lyricist poets who often are women or people of color. Um, there's that old saying, anonymous was a woman, and it's not wrong. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not wrong. Um, so one of the parts of Donna's question, though, sadly, you do have to leave people out. That's just part of the part of the situation. So I often talk about a pizza and um, ooh, I would love some pizza, <laughs> but uh, pizza <laughs> is only so large. And in order to make it bigger, you either make the entire, you know, diameter of the pizza larger or you have to take out a piece and put in a different piece. So in the confines of a 14 week semester, you can't make the pizza larger. And in fact, I find that the smaller you make the pizza, meaning the fewer subjects that you teach, the more deeply students will learn and think about those subjects rather than it just being a mad dash every day with, you know, seven composers on the agenda for that day. So you have to be very, very picky and you have to make a lot of sacrifices. One of my thoughts at a place like DePauw is all of my students are going to encounter Johannes Brahms, Franz Liszt. Mm -hmm. Most likely you will encounter composers like Aaron Copeland um, and other white canonic dead male composers. So mm -hmm. maybe I don't teach Brahms every semester that's okay. It's not like you're going to die of Brahms deficiency. You're going to be fine. Also, the fact that we think a music major graduating with a Bachelor of Music degree or BMA should know everything about Brahms, whereas you don't have to know anything at all about living, you know, women of color composers or popular music for that matter. Um, just the fact that we value certain composers over others is such a long standing problem that is rooted in white control of the curriculum. It's rooted in the belief that white c people own knowledge and excellence. Um, and when we start to interrogate those, frankly, racist and often unexamined racist beliefs that white music is superior and that classical music, which comes from uh, white culture is basically a white ethnic music, then we start to be able to realize that it's not that much of a sacrifice <laughs> to include someone like Nina Simone instead of someone like um, Aaron Copeland, for example. Yeah, so, so kind of getting to the point that music um, is, is kind of, sorry, I'm trying to, or I have so many thoughts, um, that that Western music has become more of a cultural phenomenon, but in in the sense that what Western culture is so, um, it it's not like it's so diverse now, because um, obviously of of historical like trends of of colonialism, and um, and so that's why we see especially in the expansion like. The British Empire that that so much of the world now is um, at least um, partakes in this kind of notion of of Western music, and I I think it's really interesting that you know we we cut you can cut people out not because they're bad per se like honestly I was kind of expecting you to talk about like maybe Wagner and um, maybe we shouldn't cover him because he has this like um, painful painful history with the Jewish community but maybe it's more important to talk about him be and to make sure we cover those controversies whereas we can kind of skip over um people who who are kind of you know just they 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 have beautiful music of course but maybe they don't offer anything particularly interesting in terms of social history so I think that's really interesting that we're trying to reframe our, our history. Another question I, I'm kind of thinking is like, 
who gets to decide like what what connotates good music and music of quality and I think that is kind of why we have this question like who gets to decide who gets included and who who doesn't and obviously you as a professor have have some control over that in your classroom but also you you made a reference that you're limited by the materials so um obviously the textbooks like there's seen there's a new edition every few years uh one just came out and i think you know they're they're making strides into and inc- in being more inclusive um, but I think we definitely can could see a lot more progress in that area as well. I am not in the business of teaching you facts and figures and names and dates, and I'm certainly not in the business of teaching you what is good music. I am in the business of teaching you critical thinking. That is what I care about. That's all I care about. Uh, I don't have the slightest concern for whether or not my students will pass um, Entrance exams, which I think are outdated, I think are based in white supremacy. If they if they are the kinds of entrance exams I'm thinking of, um, a lot of them are very based on entirely dead white male Western art music composer style questions that I just don't find interesting anymore. Um, so I'm interested in teaching you to be thoughtful and teaching you to consider all sorts of different elements when you encounter a piece of music, not just the goodness. I could not care less about the quality of a piece of music. To me, that is subjective, and any judgments about quality would be based entirely in the kinds of priorities that German music critics like Robert Schumann uh, would advocate for in the 19th century. They decided what is, what, they decided their priorities for what kinds of music they wanted to perpetuate and uplift, um, which was basically the kinds of music that Beethoven writes, motivic, organicist music that can be analyzed with a Shankarian model. So I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in you understanding the broad strokes of the past. <laughs> so it's important to teach Wagner every year because we wouldn't have film music and television and video game music the way we do if it weren't for Wagner's influence. Um, so Wagner is fascinating in terms of his um, socio-political impact, but he's also necessary in terms of his influence on, uh, first of all, the crisis in tonality that leads to composers like the Second Viennese School going atonal, which obviously has been one of the major threads of music composition in, in art music in the 20th century. And then also the necessity of Wagner for other kinds of dramatic music, such as film and television and video game music. So I think a lot of programs that are conservatory performance based, particularly grad school programs out there that have the kind of entrance exams you mentioned, are a lot less progressive than our music history or our full music curriculum at DePauw. And frankly, I have very little respect for an entrance exam where all the questions could be immediately Googled for like a date or a key of a piece of music. Why do you need, you don't need to know that. Uh, You just don't need to know it. If you know how to look it up and you know how to evaluate where it comes from and you know how to evaluate why people think that this is important. Um, So liberal arts is all about giving you the tools to evaluate and understand your world and how it got to be this way. So, you know, not to throw shade on the performance programs at Um, large conservatory-based performance graduate schools. I'm not throwing shade at that at all. It's these entrance exams that I am not in any way designing my curriculum to cater to. And I have full control over what I put on my syllabus. The problem there is when we adopt a course textbook and it doesn't have diverse representation, it's on the individual professor to um, fortify or to enhance that. And what that means is 
I have to give extra readings and extra listening and a lot of times students discount that they think of it as supplemental or um, you know ancillary material that's not as important or they think it's optional or they think that because that person like Florence Price is not in our textbook that means that she's not as important as the people who are so just the, the, the big fancy published hardcover book that costs an arm and a leg legitimizes certain composers. And if I want to um, enhance my syllabus with more diverse representation, a lot of times it sends a message to students that they don't need to pay as much attention. Although I think DePauw students are absolutely starving for more diverse representation and I have had extremely positive reception to diversifying my courses. Um, so, and, and I would also add that History of Western Music is the only course where we still use, or where I use a textbook. Um, and I uh, am certainly always in the process of imagining a world in which I don't use a textbook for that class. And that would allow me to put together my own anthology of what I think is most interesting for you to study. Um, and my own, you know, reading selections, which also, by the way, would have my more diverse authorship than three white American PhDs, men PhDs yeah. <laughs> on our textbook. So um, the materials are really important and students place a lot of value and authority in those materials. So, I, you know, I've gone on and on, but suffice it to say, each individual professor makes choices about their curriculum based on what they're what they're qualified to teach what they're able to do i would love to teach a world music course but i have no training in that it would take me a long time to gain the kind of expertise to do a course like that justice so it's a uh, a lot of interwoven um, sort of interlocking puzzle pieces involved oh yeah that was phenomenal thank you so much I think about this all the time. So, so yeah. you know, I don't usually pull back the curtain quite this much with a whole class. Um, but since you asked. <laughs> I'm thinking, like, so you heard it here, folks. We're not into, like, the whole cancel culture thing. We're, it's, it's more about learning how to think and, and going in deeper into both the music and the social backgrounds. Um, and I think at some level... I don't know if you're finding it with the students. I just know from from my background, um, I think it's more of a an examine of the American education system in general, at least like the K through twelve one, because um, how I always like this is totally reframing even how I think of education. Because always growing up, it was always teaching to the test, and we have Common Core curriculum like that. Teachers have to focus on these core elements to make sure that everyone is, is kind of the same. But once you get to the collegiate level, that's not the case at all. And that, I think that's one reason why we choose DePauw and we choose wherever we want to go to university is because we're free to choose what type of education we want and what and how we want to develop as as thinking citizens of our, our country and the world in that in that case. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I wanted to teach you to university level. When I was in high school, I wanted to teach high school band. But when I got to college, I realized I wanted to teach, but I wanted some more freedom. Um, and the further I got in my graduate training, the more freedom I wanted because I could see that what comes prepackaged to us, or what has in the past come prepackaged to us in the form of textbooks or whoever taught the class before, you know, gives you their syllabus. It's not necessarily the same things I think are important. Um, and this isn't about me. Every, every professor tailors their syllabi to, uh, it's sort of, it's a, it's a, like a compromise between how much new material would have to be created. So it's a lot of uncompensated summer work. And then how much um, we care about adding something, right? Would you be interested in writing your own textbook one day? Or is that like a different, is, is that just replacing one textbook with another like instrument of, of oppression and, and not enough uh, thought? Ah, so this is a great question, but it adds another layer. I am a generalist as a teacher. I teach 
I am qualified to teach anything from ancient Greek music until today, but as a scholar, as a researcher, my area of expertise is musical theater, is Broadway musicals, and yes, I would love to write a history of Broadway musicals textbook, but I am not ever going to write a history of Western music, like classical curriculum based textbook, because that's not the area that I research. I learn from those textbooks as well as from other, you know, articles um, and books that those scholars write, but my area of expertise as a scholar is musical theater. And I want to write that feminist textbook intersectional feminist textbook someday perhaps after i finish my current book <laughs> since the death of george floyd in june you've added some new content to the beginning of our our survey of western music 2 course including indigenous american music and music of enslaved peoples could you uh cover like your thought process around that right so I decided uh, to reframe the History of Western Music survey course to set the scene for talking. So traditionally, this course uh, starts with Beethoven and starts in Europe. And then gradually, we get into North America, United States. And always, that course has had several classes on the history of black music and particularly um, during enslavement and then immediately after enslavement and then also in the 20th century and, and till today. But I decided to reframe the entire course by beginning with a discussion of colonialism and the impacts of the ways that Europe extracted resources and enslaved people in order to build this enormous wealth, the likes of which the world had never seen, which is what fueled the glorious 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century of Western music in Europe. So instead of starting with Beethoven, we start with, uh, well, I started with Native American music because I've always wanted to include that in our, in our course, um, but it's not in our textbook. So it kind of, it, it took, a bit of effort to figure out a way to include that. And then I also um, started by talking about the slave orchestras that colonizers um, formed to basically force enslaved people, both transatlantic and transpacific enslaved people, to play music like Haydn and Handel in these full orchestras and choirs of enslaved people, basically playing to entertain white colonizers. Um, so none of this is meant to make students feel bad and none of it's meant to make white students feel bad about being you know, complicit in the fact that Handel multiple times invested in the slave trade or the fact that Leopold Mozart, uh, Wolfgang and Nannerl Mozart's father was fully supported by patrons who were, enslaved, uh, who were um, heavily invested in the slave trade in Europe. It's not to make students feel bad. It's to provide that framing so that we see the glories of 19th century European music don't come out of a wholesome story, right? They come out of being built on the backs of enslaved people, being built on the backs of dispossessed Native Americans and Native um, indigenous people around the world whose resources were stolen uh, by Europe. So. That's why I reframed the class a bit. And I've also added over the years, um, several years ago, before either of you got here, I made a vow that I wanted every day of that class to mention a woman or person of color and, and include a woman or person of color in, in the curriculum and that I would work gradually to do that. And I wouldn't say that every day is that diverse because some days involve, you know, looking just at Beethoven. Um, but in fact, he's one of the only composers now, Beethoven and Schoenberg, I think, are the only composers now who have a day of their own. And almost all the other days do include more diverse representation in some way. Um, so I replaced teaching about Robert Schumann with teaching only about Clara Schumann. Um, I took Steve Reich out of Minimalism Day and added Julius Eastman in. Um, I've done other kinds of substitutions, but 
fundamentally, it's about gradually, incrementally changing what kind of music we study and who we consider to be worthy of that 10 minutes of your attention, right, that we might have in a, in a given class. What direction would you like to see the future of music history take in terms of representation? Like, what other steps are necessary? So a big part of increasing representation is branching away from that Eurocentric classical music as the core of the curriculum. Uh, and this is going to involve a lot more inclusion of folk musics of various kinds and a lot more inclusion of popular musics of various kinds, including through the 19th century. But fundamentally, it's about de-westernizing. It's about including more music from other parts of the world. And this is a gradual process until, so DePauw, of course, at DePauw, we've been advocating to hire an ethnomusicologist for years, but it's expensive to hire another faculty member full time. Um, and it would involve, uh, you know, at least since I've been at DePauw, there have been a lot of budget cuts each year. And we haven't hired many faculty members at all. And all of those who we have hired have an emphasis in their um, personal teaching commitments to diverse inclusion. So um, at the level of DePauw, I think it's a matter of thinking about how we define the word music. Um, is this... DePauw School of Western Art Music by Dead Male Composers? No, it's not. I don't think any of our faculty or students would define it that way. And yet we're not explicit about what kinds of music we teach and study other than Western classical music. Um, so it comes with broadening what kinds of music we include in value, and it comes with deepening um, the curriculum so that students are really learning a lot about interesting and perhaps problematic or controversial topics and maybe stepping away from trying to cram everything into your brains in a matter of four years. Um, I think it's, it's decreasing the amount of content that we teach, but making that content more diverse and then deepening so that you have more um, thorough experience with what you do get content wise. And I think we've come, I think we've come a very long way. Um, I know I'll just, just speaking for myself personally, my classes are much more diverse than they were when I started. Every single class I teach is more diverse than it was when I started here. And a lot of that is because students have asked me to include more diverse composers. Students have asked me, and that takes a lot of courage to come into a professor's office and say, Hi, Dr. Harbert, why aren't we studying more black um, classical music uh, composers? Or why aren't we studying more trans composers? Or why aren't we studying more women in this class? Could we study more women in this class? So that's something I owe to students. And I also owe it to my colleagues um, who we talk about this kind of thing. Um, so I think we have made a huge amount of progress. I personally have grown an enormous amount. Um, and I made a vow also when I first started here or soon after I first started here that I would never teach a class that is titled with one dead white man's name. So I am more than qualified to teach a class on Wagner, on Debussy, on Leonard Bernstein. Um, I would love to teach classes like that, but I'm not going to. I'm never going to do that because I want the classes to have diverse representation in every single course. Nothing wrong with classes like that. I think they're really valuable, but I'm not that person. I might do a whole class on Dolly Parton. <gasps> Please. <laughs> we'll see. There's a lot of new material coming out about her because she's our, our uh, glowing saint angel these days. Thank you, Dolly, mm -hmm. for the upcoming COVID vaccine. I think you're in an extreme position of power in this in this case. I know it, it may be... Sometimes it's, it's hard to, like... You know, how can one person change his entire system of, of classical music? Like, like how, how am I, as one person, supposed to, to fight back against these um, systemic imbalances? But I think, um, you know, you have such an influence on so many people um, as, as a professor, as, as an expert in, in your field, that you're able to kind of in, implant these ideas into so many uh, young musicians and 
even in, you know, every every year we send out another 20, 30 musicians in, into the world. And I think um, bit by bit that we're, we can really have an impact on, on the field at large. I know something I learned from your class that I've taken into my everyday life is people say, oh, I'm playing a piece by Schumann. And I say, yes, which one? Like you always need to specify because Schumann does not always mean Robert. Um, and to the same extent, although um, Fanny Mendelssohn goes by her married name, Hensel, I always make sure, I'm like, I don't ever say just Mendelssohn because I think that's rooted in the patriarchal sense of the last name always belongs to the man. And that's, I don't think that's true now. And I don't think it's been true in the past. Thank you and for so, doing that. <laughs> always do that. Just always do that. You know, and, and even if it, we don't have to change every single person in the world, but hey, you've had an effect on at least one, and I think I'm speaking for Michaela here, two. And and isn't that a magnitude unto itself? Yeah, you've really put a finger on why I wake up in the morning and why I do what I do. I feel this very much. And it's not a large number of people, right? And I don't want to work at a big school. I don't want that. Um, I, I, I won't say what I don't want. What I do want is to have personal relationships with each student. And that's just not possible at a big school. So what I love most about my job is that I'm here to serve not just the individual students. I mean, my primary job is serving you as individual students, but my secondary job is making the world a little bit better by sending people out in the world who are thoughtful. I am not, I will object to your, you used the word implanting these ideas. I have no intention of implanting anything. I have no intention of um, forcing anyone to take my opinion or point of view. I want to teach you how to think about it for yourself. Um, and I want to explain expose you to a wide variety of new ideas and new people. But this is why I get up in the morning and I feel an enormous responsibility. Um, I feel an enormous joy, enormous joy. Yesterday or on Monday, we had a class on Buffy St. Marie, the Native American folk singer. Um, well, folk, but she also has done lots and lots of other kinds of genres. And almost no one in our class had ever heard of her before. And it filled me with absolute joy to share about her with all of you and to right a wrong that she's had, she's faced so much erasure in her career. I am not going to erase her when I talk, when I teach a course on women in Western music. But you know what? In order to teach Buffy St. Marie, I had to not teach other white women folk singer composers like Joni Mitchell, who I would have loved to teach. Um, so I think it's a huge responsibility and I don't always do it right. I don't always live up to my own hopes for myself, sometimes just because it takes so much preparation and sometimes you can't find materials that are appropriate, um, you know, at, a, at an undergrad level that you'll be able to read and enjoy. But yeah, I mean, our sphere of influence spans out from us. I very much believe that each person who I influence will then influence other people. And if I can be a good influence, not just in like how I teach, but like the fact that I care about you as people, um, maybe that is an, a, a role model that I can actually, I can actually be a role model um, not just in what I teach, but in how I teach. And I know that that might sound incredibly egotistical, but frankly, it's what it's what's getting me through is this idea that I can teach just by the way that I interact with students and by the way I treat you with respect and care, um, which is also a feminist practice it's, it's or praxis. It's not an unintentional. It's not just my personality. My personality is is irrelevant. It's a decision it's a teaching decision that is based on feminist praxis. Wow, I I really love that. Um, I haven't heard of of her either, and so um, I'm going to Buffy St. Marie. To... Oh, look her up. She's phenomenal, and she's 78 years old. She's been putting out music since the 60s. Spectacular. <laughs> that, and I think that's that's also very powerful in in itself. Like that, the survey of, of Western music, or rather, 
I guess, music at large is not meant to be like the end all be all. The this is, this is all you ever need to know. There's also that level of self exploration. Like you go out and we have all these resources. Like we don't obviously you you do an an amazing job at at, at teaching us and and uh, like you said exposing us to new material but by all means like it is it is also on us the individual to go out and learn of our own accord what we're interested in and i think um you know i can go out and like hey i'll read the the grove article on on brahms but i'm equally as capable as as um looking for for other materials and 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 new musicians and artists that I've I've never heard before and I think that's kind of the power is that um on some level we're already familiar with many many um of the dead white men of classical music and so that we're more capable of of using those skills that Depa and, and you have taught us as as writers as readers as critical thinkers whereas um uplifting voices like um Buffy St. Marie is that that's uh that's that's something that's um maybe harder to to find on a, a surface level like that and so um that's that's more relevant to to the even idea of education is is getting at least that base level of oh i've i've heard her name let me look more in in depth into that yeah if there is one thing i do kind of want to implant into your brains it's just that little voice in your head saying what if I look for a more diverse concert program you know person to put on this what if, it's that little voice saying what if I intentionally diversify what I'm doing here I don't care with whom, I don't expect you to carry on, you know, the specific people that I've chosen, which are quite idiosyncratic to me. It's that little voice saying, what if we should, what if I should write to my, you know, the uh, orchestra, the symphony orchestra director in my town and say, hey, you didn't compose, you didn't perform any music by black composers in the last five years, maybe you should. Um, and, and have the vocabulary to advocate for that kind of diverse representation. Are there any examples of 21st century musicians or just musicians in general that you want to see more included in the current education? You know, I would rather you explore and have, because there are so many, like there's an endless variety. Um, we could have every concert from the rest for the rest of you know, the next five years be all music by black women or all music by trans composers or, you know, there's a huge number of active, vibrant, amazing musicians and composers out there more than ever before. And they're more accessible and available. We can find their music. We can find recordings again, especially if we open up the the word 21st century musician, not to mean just written down art music style for Western instruments. So I would hand it over to you to find them. When I chose music for those um, convocation hours, when, when we did that collaboratively, I just thought to myself, okay, I think that this playlist should be almost entirely black musicians. So that's what I'm going to add. Um, and there were, you know, an infinite variety of people to choose from. So after that point, it was basically just arbitrary. Um, just prioritizing, I would like for people to listen to some pe some more diverse music. Um, yeah, I am more than happy for you all to explore on your own. But there are some people I'm looking at <laughs> who I'm really passionate about um, and, you know, listen to on my own. I know personally when we were listening through those, I was thinking, like, how much how excited I got over being able to hear music that I actually like knew and loved like pop music even even though I don't consider myself that much of a, a listener of, of pop music I, I appreciate it um and and the example I always was always was always blown away by um was we listened to Old Town Road by Lil Nas X 
And I think that's an amazing example of uh, the 21st century notion of like all these um, multiplicities of genre and crossing over them and combining them in new ways. And I think that's why um, he received such uh, acclaim from from the the many, many spheres of of music. Um, And of course, that came with maybe an equal amount of pushback. Yeah, um, and you know, but, you know who decided again, that Old Town Road should be an enormous hit? Really his diverse 18-year-olds, <laughs> basically. Hugely diverse young people made those decisions because that's what they liked. That decision was not made by 19th century German men who are critics, right? It came from the people. And... So the standards that we use to decide what is good are inherently problematic and usually fairly based in white supremacy and white control. Um, And so that's why I don't think that that's an interesting question. I don't care whether Old Town Road is a great piece of music or not. I care that it's awesome how many people love it and how many people have made tributes and, you know, et cetera. What a cultural impact it's had, basically. And that probably, it's, it's, because of like technological innovations that we can do that, that there's so much more equal access to music um, than there ever has been. Yeah, and to having your opinion heard. Because now, the again, with the dead white German 19th century critics, they were the only ones who could get their opinions out there in these printed newspapers, like the one that Robert Schumann founded. Now, anybody can make a TikTok or tweet or do an insta or whatever and we can hear more diverse voices that don't have to be authoritative or don't have to have like credibility or that's not the right word credentials that's the word credentials granted by some higher power that is usually more conservative and more um exclusive and the measure of one's success isn't oh like i got got good reviews On, on some levels maybe like i i don't really know how grammys are so i think there's an academy or or whatever that like choose but a lot more of success is how many people uh listen to your music and how many times and and i promise you there's you know lil nas x did not receive millions and millions of streams from a very small group of people it, it's it's really uh is it fair to say Dem- a demagogical approach, like uh, a populist approach, to to ascertaining um, what music uh, enjoys uh, success, and I think that's that's a really amazing thing that we've been seeing. I, I love seeing everyone's Spotify's wrapped for the year, and I'm like, that this is so incredible to hear. <laughs> you want to like- you want to know what's at the top of my Spotify wrapped though? Yes, yes I do. It's almost entirely the sounds of water running through caves or waterfalls or rain because that's what I listen to when I'm working. I can't listen to music when I work. Um, It's almost all like karst cave and it's just like the sound of water trickling through a cave or uh, the sound of a waterfall. But when you get below those, my top artists were Beyonce and Sekou Keita, who is a um, Senegalese Kora player, so from West Africa. Um, so that's what I listened to most. <laughs> Water. <laughs> Music to my ears. That's so cool. Like, at it, some level, you can see everyone's taste in, in music. And I think, you know, everyone gets to be their own critic. And, and that's that's normal now. And, and I, I love that. I don't have Spotify but I do know that when I work, I listen to longer orchestral pieces, and you can tell how uh, <laughs> how mentally well I am by by which pieces I've chosen. Last night I was listening to Rite of Spring over and over again, so take that as you will. <laughs> I was not feeling very well. Ooh, <laughs> Donna, I'm worried. I'm worried, hon. Do you have any current... Or future projects. You briefly mentioned some stuff. So this is your platform. (laughs) Well, I'm planning some new courses um, that won't be available for a while. Not not before you're graduated, for sure. Um, I want to do a course on the history of popular song in the United States. So that will have a very wide variety of of songs from back in, you know, the um, the Revolutionary War era to the present. 
We're also working as a faculty to consider ways of bringing more world music uh, opportunities to DePauw, so more global music experiences. So that's hopefully going to start in the spring, and I don't want to make a formal announcement of anything, but we are working on an initiative that will give you more opportunities with global artists. Um, and yeah, I mean, my commitment I make publicly to you is just to keep putting as much thought and intention into making my courses diverse as I possibly can. Every person I put on my syllabus, I'm interrogating. I'm saying, do they need to know this person? Um, is there someone who would be better for a variety of reasons, uh, more interesting to them? And am I making sure that each student who comes through to PA sees people like them represented on our syllabus? Awesome. Thank you so much for agreeing to, to be here and, and and letting us uh, pick your brain a bit about uh, the issues that we're facing today in, in our our world of music. And um, I look forward to to talking again later. My pleasure. It's been a, it's been a joy. To all of our listeners, go out into the world. And if somebody says Schumann, ask which one. <laughs> Do it. <laughs>